In the closeout for Unit 6, we're going to look at Topic 6.8, Biotechnology. Although biotechnology in the current modern sense probably evokes images of laboratories, scientists with goggles and gloves, and microscopes and other technologies, humans have been influencing the genetic makeup of organisms for millennia. About 12,000 years ago, people began settling in fixed places rather than migrating in a nomadic fashion. Growing and raising their own food, instead of searching and hunting for it, led to people selectively pollinating and breeding plants and animals, altering their genomes. This form of evolution, called artificial selection, will be looked at in the next unit. The direct manipulation of genetic material like DNA has only existed for about 50 years. We will be exploring four specific technologies of modern genetic engineering. Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, bacterial transformation, gel electrophoresis, and DNA sequencing. Before we begin to take a look at those technologies, it will first be important to understand one of the most useful tools used in many biotechnologies. Perhaps one of the most important ones is a class of enzymes called restriction endonucleases. A restriction endonuclease is an enzyme that cleaves or cuts DNA into fragments at specific sequences called restriction or recognition sites. These enzymes are found in prokaryotes only and are used by them as a defense mechanism against invading viruses. Inside the prokaryote, the enzymes selectively cut up foreign DNA only in a process called restriction digestion. Over 3,000 restriction enzymes have been discovered, and over 800 kinds are used routinely for DNA modification in laboratories. Some restriction enzymes have restriction sites that yield a staggered cut, whereas others produce straight cuts. Those that produce staggered cuts do so by breaking not only phosphodiester bonds in the two backbones, but they also disrupt the hydrogen bonds linking the nitrogenous bases together in the restriction site. Because this kind of cut produces unbase paired overhangs, we describe them as sticky ends. If two separate samples of DNA are digested by the same restriction enzyme, they would have complementary sticky ends, allowing the two fragments to be joined together. This process is used in the laboratory to engineer plasmids by inserting fragments of foreign DNA into them. Be sure to take a look at the link above if you'd like to view an animation on how this is accomplished. One of the mechanisms by which bacteria undergo changes to their genetic material is transformation. This can occur naturally in the environment and result in changes to the genetic makeup of a bacterial cell, a form of mutation, or can be accomplished artificially in the lab. Plasmids are engineered by researchers to contain a variety of genetic material, but at the very least they would need to possess a gene conferring antibiotic resistance to bacteria and a gene of interest that the researcher wishes to study. Once the plasmid vector and the recipient bacteria are prepared, the simplified process is as follows. Bacteria are first subjected to physical and chemical stressors that increase the likelihood that they will take in the plasmid that they're exposed to in their environment. Some bacteria will take in the plasmid and be transformed, while others will not. The bacteria are then spread on a petri dish containing an antibiotic. Those bacteria that were transformed will have the ability to survive in the presence of the antibiotic but the untransformed bacteria will be killed off. The surviving bacteria not only possess copies of the gene of interest, they can also manufacture the protein the gene codes for by expressing it. Since bacteria are easily manipulated and grown in the lab, 
and plasmids are convenient vectors for introducing exogenous DNA, the practical applications of such a technology are classified as either gene cloning or protein harvesting. Making multiple copies of a functional gene allows researchers to study them and their function in the lab. The genes can also be excised from the plasmids so that they can be transferred to other organisms, genetically modifying them. Protein products of the gene of interest that were incorporated into the plasmid can also be harvested. In this way, bacteria are essentially used as living protein factories, creating proteins that can be studied further in the lab or as treatments for medical conditions. The first human insulin was produced in the lab using this method in 1978 and ultimately became commercially available four years later for people with type 1 diabetes. Oftentimes, studying a DNA sample results in the destruction of that sample. Also, it's not uncommon for researchers to have only a small amount of DNA to study. Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, is a method used to rapidly make millions to billions of copies of a DNA sample. Unlike the gene cloning process, PCR does not require living cells to accomplish the copying or amplification process. The process involves the use of the DNA sample to be copied, free DNA nucleotides, primers, and a special heat-resistant DNA polymerase called TAC polymerase that was first isolated from bacteria that live in the extremely hot water springs of Yellowstone National Park. The video linked above explains how, using a device called the thermal cycler, progress through a series of temperature increases and decreases, separate the two strands of DNA, allow the primers to attach, and then the replication of DNA can proceed. PCR was invented in 1983 and has since become an invaluable tool in DNA research. It has allowed scientists to amplify the DNA samples from extinct organisms like the woolly mammoth and the Neanderthal. Minute samples of DNA from a crime scene can be amplified, making it possible for forensic scientists to link alleged suspects to crimes. For people in need of organ transplants, PCR provides for a quick, reliable way to match potential organ donors to organ recipients. PCR is useful in both detecting the presence of viral DNA, but also in identifying different strains or variants of a virus. Epidemiologists can use the information obtained to track how a virus and its variants are spreading through a population. Prior to sequencing DNA or creating a unique DNA fingerprint in gel electrophoresis, DNA samples are copied using PCR. And now, Let's take a look at gel electrophoresis. Gel electrophoresis is a method used to separate fragments of macromolecules, such as DNA, based on their size and charge. The process begins when an amplified sample of DNA is digested by a collection of restriction enzymes. Because the restriction enzymes cleave DNA at specific recognition sites, the digestion yields a collection of DNA fragments some of which are relatively large and some relatively small. The digested sample is transferred to the well of a porous gel-like material and then an electrical current is applied. The phosphates in the backbone of DNA confers a negative charge to the molecule. This results in the DNA being repelled by the negative electrode and attracted to the positive one as it migrates through the gel. Smaller DNA fragments are able to move more quickly through the gel, whereas larger ones migrate more slowly. After a period of time, the electric current is switched off, and the resulting pattern of bands can be analyzed. To visualize the bands, a staining process, or the use of fluorescent dyes, are commonly used. DNA from different sources have different sequences of nucleotides, 
This means that the location and quantity of restriction enzyme recognition sites will vary by DNA source. This model illustrates how two individuals of the same species may in fact have different quantities and sizes of fragments that result from a restriction enzyme digest. When their digested DNA samples are electrophoresed, the DNA fragments of different sizes and quantities will show up as different bands in a gel. The fragments will have migrated different distances based on their size, yielding a unique band pattern for that individual. It is typical for researchers to include a sample of DNA comprised of known fragment sizes called a ladder or marker. Using the marker, a researcher can approximate the sizes of the fragments in the other samples, analogous to the way that one would use a ruler. Gel electrophoresis is an invaluable tool in creating DNA fingerprints used for analyzing DNA recovered from a crime scene and comparing it to alleged suspect DNA. In this example, the band pattern of suspect number two's DNA matches that of the DNA found at a crime scene. Gel electrophoresis is also useful in researching the differences between typically functioning genes and those altered genes associated with genetic illnesses. Paternity can also be established using this technology. In this model, we can see that an offspring shares a portion of the banding pattern with their mother, but the other bands present in the offspring's pattern are derived from the father's DNA. And an increasingly important application of gel electrophoresis is in the field of evolution. Creating and analyzing DNA fingerprints of different species allows for scientists to determine the evolutionary relationships that exist between them. The final biotechnology is one with a self-explanatory name, DNA sequencing. This technology is used to determine the sequence of nucleotides for a given DNA sample, an entire gene, or whole genome. Since its beginnings in the 1970s, the technologies involved in DNA sequencing have changed rapidly. They have evolved from a tedious, time-consuming, expensive process that incorporated elements of gel electrophoresis to a highly automated computer-controlled process. Take a look at the video linked above from the University of New South Wales in Australia to learn more about a couple of the methods used to sequence DNA. The practical value of DNA sequencing is widespread. Medical technicians can sequence genes to determine if there is a risk of genetic disease. DNA sequencing may be useful for establishing the presence of a specific disease-causing bacterium, allowing for more precise antibiotic treatments. Sequencing is used to chart the genome of viruses, as well as for the diagnosis of emerging viral infections. This allows researchers to tailor treatments or preventative measures like vaccines to specific viruses. DNA sequencing may be used along with DNA fingerprinting for forensic identification. Since the DNA found in bodily fluids, like saliva and blood, is unique, sequencing DNA can detect the presence of a highly specific genome. DNA is an information-carrying molecule as it is transmitted from one generation to another. Sequencing of DNA is useful in evolutionary biology to study not only how organisms are related, but also how they evolved. In February of 2021, scientists were able to sequence the DNA of a mammoth that lived over a million years ago, creating the oldest DNA sequence to that point. That closes out our look at biotechnology and Unit 6. Until the next unit, take care.